Welcome to Who to Thunk It with Zeb, episode four. Let me ask you, right now, as you listen to this podcast, are you awake or are you dreaming? Before you answer, how can you be sure you aren't asleep right now in a very lucid dream? Whether you are driving to work, folding your laundry, how can you know you aren't dreaming? No, this episode isn't about the movie Inception starring Leonardo DiCaprio. This is the question my undergraduate philosophy professor, Dr. Andrew Colvin from Slipper Rock University, asked his intro to philosophy class. Obviously, he asked it without the podcast bit, but I remember him asking the class with a reluctant smile sh showing across his face. He waited patiently for members of the class to respond because... I woke up this morning, and I haven't gone back to sleep since then, a student answered. His response to them, but how do you know that waking up wasn't just another part of your dream? He went on to question us, asking how we know anything is real, how we know anything is the truth. It is a daunting question, one that is made easier to grasp with the example of whether you are dreaming or not. So that's why he asked it. Our professor was just introducing us to one of the most famous conclusions ever drawn in Western philosophy, cogito ergo sum. That is what this episode is about, cogito ergo sum. It was started by René Descartes, a French citizen who lived between 1596 and 1650. He wrote Discourse on Method in 1637, which is 100% free <clears throat> and in the public domain, by the way. Uh, Google it if you ever feel you're in the mood for some very heavy philosophical reading. <laughs> Cogito, Cogito ergo sum is Latin, and translated into English, it means, I think, therefore I am. It was originally French, French, je pense donc je suis, Descartes, Descartes started by asking a simple question, what can I know with absolute certainty? Or maybe nothing is certain at all. <clears throat> he decided to use a method of doubt where he doubted everything. He started by questioning each of his five senses, sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. One by one, he found examples where these senses failed him. <clears throat> Some examples that he used himself was placing a stick in a glass of water makes it appear bent, when in reality the stick is straight. Objects far away appear as if they're smaller, so that could trick the eye. You can find modern examples, you know, having the feeling that your phone is vibrating in your pocket even though you check it and you have no notifications. Your senses fail you all the time, you just have gotten used to it, or you don't know that is what's happening. This is how magicians have careers, basically. Neil deGrasse Tyson said that those books that are called brain games, brain benders, should be called brain failures because they are showing you ways that your senses fail you. You perceive them as magic or illusions, but simply put, they are hacking your brain's ability to perceive the real world. Scrolling through social media, I see posts that have Ill instructions like stare at the dot in the center of this image for 30 seconds or more, then look away, or something along those lines. And when you do look away, you see these circles burn into your vision or some other form of optical um, trickery. These are the same kind of optical illusions as those brain-bending books. Descartes found that all different kinds of so-called truths could be doubted in a fundamental way. The Encyclopedia Britannica does a great job of summarizing it. It says, He found knowledge from tradition to be dubitable, I love that word, because authorities disagree. Empirical knowledge dubitable, because of illusions, hallucinations, and dreams. And mathematical knowledge dubitable, because people make errors in calculating. He proposed an all-powerful deceiving demon as a way of invoking universal doubt. Although the demon could deceive men regarding which sensations and ideas are truly of the world, or could give them sensation and ideas, none of which are of the true world, or could even make them think that there is an external world when there is none, the demon could not make them think that they exist when they do not. As a first step in demonstrating the attainability of certain knowledge, cogito ergo sum is the only statement to survive the test of Descartes' method of doubt. 
The statement is indubitable. As Descartes argued in the second of his six meditations on first philosophy in 1641, because even if an all-powerful demon were to try to deceive him into thinking that he exists when he does not, he would have to exist in order for the demon to deceive him. Therefore, whenever he thinks, he exists. <laughs> Descartes sought to find the end point of skepticism. What, if anything, can be impervious to doubt? I love that. The end point of skepticism. <clears throat> he came to the conclusion of cogito ergo sum. Here are some quotes from Descartes that give a better understanding of his way of thinking, and I'll try to summarize each of them in my own way. So, quote, it is not enough to have a good mind. The main, the main thing is to use it well, end quote. I believe this plays off of the Christian cardinal sin of sloth. To commit sloth is to waste one's talents, and Descartes is saying, if you have a good mind, use it. Here, quote, the greatest minds are capable of the greatest vices as well of well as the greatest virtues. Hemingway, Hunter S. Thompson, and many more grading, writing greats were terrible drug and alcohol problem, or addicts. A great mind is a blessing and a curse, a double-edged sword, if you will. Which you can find lots of examples for that. Quote, Except our own thoughts, there is nothing absolutely in our power. That is uh, pretty self-explanatory and applies quite well to the to cogito ergo sum, basically saying our thoughts are the only thing we truly control. Divide each or quote divide each difficulty into as many parts as feasible and necessary to resolve it. End quote. This is what Descartes did. So this was his method when he found the end point of skepticism, cogito ergo sum, to question everything he picked reality apart bit by bit to draw his conclusion. Quote, it is only prudent never to place complete confidence in that by which we have even once been deceived. End quote. So not for one, not one for second chances, Descartes was trying to find something that can be trusted as an absolute truth. So he ruled out anything that had ever, you know, lied to him in the past, anything that ever deceived him. Quote, if you would be a real seeker after truth, it is necessary that at least once in your life, you doubt as far as possible all things. Now, I love this quote. It speaks to the conspiracy theorist of the world. Go about your day and trust certain things in a practical level. Yeah, sure. But keep in the back of your mind that this could all be a lie. <laughs> <clears throat> And then, when it is not in our power to follow what is true, we ought to follow what is most probable. So, Descartes kind of reins it in with this one, saying, like I said, you know, go about your day in a, in a practical level. To me, it is saying the only absolute truth so, so far is that we exist, but we have to apply this to everyday life in a practical, probable sense. Okay. So what can anyone do with this information, cogito ergo sum? First, for me, uh, this is my opinion, <clears throat> I see it as an empowering notion, you know? I exist. This is an idea some people might say, yeah, I already knew I exist. But for me, it puts like an emphasis on my consciousness, an emphasis on my mind, and it like validates my existence. Not that I necessarily need it, but it feels great to have it. I don't know. I, it's, it's empowering, and I, I think it's awesome. The power of the mind. Second, I see it as a key to keeping an open mind. You know, carrying around the notion that you know almost nothing is as an absolute truth allows a person to see the world in different ways than those who take the world at face value. So you're able to pick and pry at things that most other people take as an absolute truth where you you know there really is hardly any absolute truth in the world so therefore you question it those are the two things i take away from cogito ergo sum it's empowering and it gives me an edge but there's a balance to questioning reality and descartes method of doubt is an interesting route to take to find that balance um, you can run away with the idea and act all paranoid 
all the time, like a heavy breathing conspiracy theorist, or you can find yourself being far too trusting in things and fall victim to those who would deceive you. There's a balance. I think it's having a healthy mind, having a healthy lifestyle helps with that as well. Last episode, I talked about the Truman Show delusion, and, and some people were experiencing delusions about their reality being fake. I also referenced the Matrix films and how the Matrix is a simulated reality. These are pop culture examples of cogito ergo sum. These stories were inspired by Descartes' statement. So this podcast is all about giving my listeners more knowledge so they can see the world in a different light, look at it in a different lens. This podcast also um, can be categorized as an adult show and tell, basically. Every week I plug in my mic and like to talk about what I learned that week. <laughs> but this episode is about one of the most important perspectives I was ever given as a young adult. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you look at philosophy with a bit more interest. Be because philosophy is all about using different perspectives. Also, I encourage you to look up Descartes' work yourself. This was a, an incredibly brief summation of his findings. Tune in next week. I'll be going over the Great Emu War. That's right, Emu, the Australian bird. <laughs> I hope you enjoy. Also, I've been putting these up on YouTube with some added visuals. Check it out. Tune in next week.